Welcome to the next episode of Lessons from the Lab. I'm Devin Rubin from Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, and I'll be hosting this new episode for you today. I've been really excited for this episode. I have a great guest with me today, uh, Dr. John Kincaid from Indiana University. Dr. Kincaid is a very experienced neurologist, very experienced electromyographer, someone who I've had lots of conversations with, not only about EMG, but about history of EMG, history of neurology, and life issues as well. And uh, I always learn something from him. He, he's got a great sense of humor. He's got great experience. He's well-published in the field and really has vast experience in the practicalities of what we do. So I'm going to try to challenge him a bit with a, with a challenging case and gain some insight from him. And uh, hopefully you'll learn something as will I. So enjoy the episode. Well, welcome to the next episode of Lessons from the Lab. I'm excited to have uh, a great neurologist and a good friend, Dr. John Kincaid, who's professor of neurology at Indiana University, joining me today. Hi, John. Hey, thanks for the invite. <clears throat> You're welcome. Thanks for coming. How are things in, in, in IU? They're very good. We have lots of interesting cases, good residents in both neurology, physical medicine, rehab, and uh, every day is exciting. You know, there's every day brings another variety of Charcomery tooth and limb girdle dystrophy to try to keep track of. They just keep adding, adding to the genes, right? Yep. Yeah. Were you uh, working in the EMG lab today or is this not a EMG day? This was an EMG day, and we had an absolutely fabulous case of what I think was pseudo post osseous syndrome. You know, a, a person with wrist and finger drop who looked for the world like PIN, but uh, you poke the pronator teres, and they're just as abnormal as the wrist extensors and the triceps and with normal sensory. So I think it was a so-called post or pseudo post osseous syndrome, finger drop and wrist drop. Huh, that's so, really interesting. Yeah, so, fairly rare. Yeah. I had one uh, a couple of weeks ago with our fellow that was also kind of mimicked uh, that, but had a very severe C8 radiculopathy. Mm -hmm. And it was so interesting because the, you know, you could tease out the differences in, say, the flex uh, extensor carpi radialis from the extensor carpi ul uh, ulnaris. And you know, it was one of those teaching points that if you just kind of raise the wrist up and test that or just test, you know, one muscle, you might miss it instead of testing with ulnar and radial deviation. And it, it was a fuller. Which, yes. Which, which... Absolutely great uh, a correlation of, of anatomy, clinical exam, and what the needle shows, you know. It's always nice when it all makes sense and it, it is, all fits yeah. together. Yeah, sometimes, that, as you well know, it doesn't. It doesn't always fit together, right? We always say we write the textbooks, but patients don't read the textbooks, especially the, in the EMG lab. Or the resident pokes the uh, wire in the wrong preamp lead or something like that. Yeah, right. It keeps this going working. It absolutely it's, does, you know. Yeah. Well, I wanted to present a case that one of the goals of the, these lessons from the labs, as you may know, is to... Um, is, is to learn from each other and teach anyone who is bored and is watching this and having their popcorn and, and wants to learn something about EMG or neuromuscular diseases to for us to uh, teach them something practical, at least hopefully based on our experience or your experience. So I was hoping I could share a case with you and pick your brain on it. Be it up. All right. So uh, this patient, this was a case that we had in our lab a few weeks ago. Uh, it was a 55-year-old man who was sent for numbness in his feet. Mm -hmm. And he basically just had some, it, it had been going on maybe six months. He had some tingling and numbness in the toes, and it kind of extended up to the balls of his feet. He felt like there were socks bunched up under his shoes. Mm. Bunched and up socks, yes. Bunched up to that. That's the bunched up sock side. Bunched up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. And um and uh really that was pretty much it. It was more mainly sensory. It didn't extend up higher above his feet. Didn't really have any back pain. 
uh, didn't complain of any any symptoms in his hands. And uh, on his exam, you like to examine patients, right? I do. I still, uh, you know, I still examine my my kit is right up here, you know, my <laughs> toolbox and so forth. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. What's what's your favorite tool as a neurologist? Um. Well. I like my hammer. I mean, this is the Mayo hammer. This is the Mercedes Benz of reflex hammers. You know, it's perfectly balanced. You can replace the tires if they uh, wear out and so forth. So this is my favorite tool, a Traumner hammer. Doesn't it just feel great when you have that in your hand? It is absolutely. You know, it's yeah. just, uh, it's, just um, it's perfectly balanced. It has the right weight, the right swing. So that's my favorite tool. Yeah. So that's the hammer you use, not the little tomahawk hammer. Nope. I spent yeah. most of my career using the tomahawk. And then when I started getting involved in some of the clinical research trials, like for diabetic neuropathy and particularly the amyloid treatments, uh, you know, we had to use the same reflex hammer across the entire world. And so that's when I changed to these. And also we have to use the wool cotton. And I got a roll of from that from Dr. Dick probably uh, 15 years ago for a, a diabetic treatment trial. And I still have enough to last for about nine <laughs> more lifetimes. Yeah. Is that the original roll? Uh, yeah. Well, no, this is a part of it. I've got it down. <laughs> I still have about, the, you know, if this was a uh, Thanksgiving roll, uh, I've got it. I've got the, about four <laughs> more layers of myelin. Wow. Well, next time I'm in, I'm in Indiana, you'll have to share a little bit of your role with me. I would be delighted to. <laughs> yeah, that's great. All right. Well, I like my hammer too, and I used my hammer on this patient, and uh, he did have reduced Achilles reflexes. They were present, but they were about 50% reduced. His strength was normal in his legs. Mm -hmm. And he did have a gradient to pinprick and reduction in vibration to about his ankles. Okay. So I, so I guess the question, so that was the story, his, his, yeah. his medical history, he didn't have diabetes, um, really was a healthy person, real, no medical, significant medical problems. And he didn't have any family history that was similar. What's uh, the duration of the symptoms? It's been about six months. Okay. All right. So I guess, so if, I guess the first question I'd ask you is, do you, would, if you saw this patient in clinic, would you, would you order an EMG? I would, um, to try to better define, uh, what's going on now, you know, some of our, uh, colleagues that have looked at study utilization would say that, that an EMG is not needed. You run your lab studies, you do your clinical exam and then come up with your opinion there. But I would go ahead and, and get this person EMG, basically to sort out, are we dealing with an axonal or a demyelinating lesion? Yeah. Do you, I, do you, is that something you can tell without an EMG? Um, well, if the patient was diffusely uh, hyporeflexic or areflexic, that would favor a little bit more. Uh, that it was an acquired demyelination rather than an axonopathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess the other thing I've always remember, I don't do this very often, and maybe I should do it more often than not, is palp try to palpate some of the nerves, like the, yeah. uh, you know, the occipital greater auricular nerve and see if you have large nerves. But I've never been very good at at determining that. See, that's why I didn't become an endocrinologist. I could never feel the lobes of the thyroid during swallowing. So <laughs> yeah, that's right. why I had to become an electrician. Right. We could test muscles, but feeling those yeah. little things. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, it's, although I can feel my radial, you know, the radial sensory. I can feel the little vermicelli or linguini right across there. I can still do that. Right. That's the one we have to when we do our radial sensory Absolutely. Uh, conduction yeah. study. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, so you would do an EMG. I, I would too, but. Yeah, I mean, what would you be? You're thinking what? I guess I in this patient has a neuropathy, right? Yep, they most likely have a polyneuropathy because of the distal location and the sensory predominance. <clears throat> and I guess the other point that we, I think, we teach our residents, and it doesn't, it doesn't sound as pertinent in this patient, but patients with radiculopathies, L5 S1, can the, the dermatomes are at the top and bottom of the foot, right? So yes. 
could this be spinal stenosis? Could this be something involving roots that we can't tease out necessarily clinically? Okay. So, so what, how do you approach these patients in the lab after doing the exam and history and exam? What, what do you usually do in well, your lab? We would start um, uh, with a sural sensory. Look at that. Uh, first of all, though, we would make sure the patient was adequately warm. You know, uh, we have the infrared thermometers that we read, although my fingertips are calibrated to point, point 0.5 degrees C, if not <laughs> point, point, uh, point 0.1 degrees C. But we would measure the temperature. And then if they're 32, uh, 30, 32, we'd, I'd proceed. So I'd start with a sural sensory. Uh, I like that better than a superficial perineal. Uh, I think it's just a little easier to do. We've got more uh, standardized values and so forth. So, and I'm I would do just a 14 centimeter uh, stimulation sural sensory and see what we get. You know, this this isn't meant to be like the board examination. You know yes. that we used to do the oral boards, but it, I know sometimes well, we it sounds like this. Up. Yeah, where exactly would you stimulate and record from? No, I'm just kidding. Yes, that was a rite of passage. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I I was disappointed when we took that away from the boards. You know. Yeah, me too. That was a fun, fun thing. Both, both as a, a, uh, being examined and an examiner too. Yes. So, exactly. so, but I'm, I'm curious though. So you start, you don't start with motors. You start with the sensory. I start with the sensories partly because if, um, if you, if your patient comes in and they're warm, you know, and you start with motors, and you know, if you're in a teaching lab where a simple uh, one motor study might take several minutes or more, uh, and the patient's a little nervous, they would cool off. Mm -hmm. So that's why yeah. we usually start with sensories. And uh, even if the patient's warm, I cover the cover them with a blanket. Mm -hmm. So I would yeah. start with the sensory and then uh, go on next to perineal motor, perineal or fibular motor, whichever is the correct term now. Mm hmm and and then do you do any any others routinely or do you wait and see what those two show if both of those are normal i would probably quit now okay. if the sural is abnormal and the perineal is abnormal then i would go ahead to a posterior tibial motor as well okay so can i show you i'm going to show you what we did if you and see what you think and okay. sounds good uh, i'm going to share my screen here and let's see, hopefully I'm going to try to make this large and yeah, it looks good. So, so we actually, in our lab, we do a, a little bit different. We usually start with the motors and, mm -hmm. but I understand your point and we do the same thing. We, we continuously monitor the temperature and keep them as warm as possible, but this is the, uh, hopefully this isn't being blocked by, but this is the fibular oh. motor. Yeah, I can see that. And, um, yeah. Response amplitudes look good. Look, look good. Yeah. Your distal latencies are fine, and your velocity at 44 meters per second for a 55 year old person, uh, I think this is okay. Yeah. And the waveforms look, uh, look uh, good. Yeah. So I that's what I thought, and uh, but we we also do we do usually do both the fibular and the tibials. So mm -hmm. we, we did do F waves here. I don't, do you do that routinely in a situation like this? Not routinely, uh, but your Fs look uh, okay there at uh, your, um, your latency is 52. And for a normal size individual, I would call that okay. 56 is, was as our traditional upper limit of normal, 57 for the perineal, the mm -hmm. fibular. And do you use an an F estimate like we have here, do you calculate that or just do only, absolute? Only if they're the center of the Indianapolis Pacers or a midget. Okay. The short. So if they're a standard government issue size uh, patient, we would usually just rely on the absolute value. So if someone's between five foot and if, if you have a five foot and a six foot patient, you don't think there would be a significant difference in the F wave? There would, uh, you know, it still would be a then normal limb, the same cutoff. Well, for the uh, six footer, yes, but for the five footer, uh, it would likely be shorter, you know, by several yeah. milliseconds. Right. Yeah. But so assuming, we... assuming everything else was okay, 
uh, and we're not looking at acute lesion like a maybe an evolving Guillain Beret, I would still just rely on the absolute value in that situation. Yeah. Okay. We all, we have debates about F waves and you know the utility of them, and I think it, it, for us and I, you know, our our rationale is in patients that we think might have neuropathy, we can't tell if it's a distal neuropathy or a polyradiculopathy. Mm -hmm. And so in those patients, we'll usually do F waves just to, to see, is there any clue that it's a more proximal root lesion? I'm absolutely fine with that. And the other merit of the F is it's kind of a quality control on your other values, you know, that if the F is normal and your velocity, conduction velocity is slow, that some, somebody screwed up, you know, you've got right. an incorrect distance. So uh, the real merit from my viewpoint is that it's an internal control on your other values in a motor study. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Well, that's, so that looked pretty good. I, I agree. And so here's the tibial motor. Okay. So I, this is where I'm curious of your thoughts here. So okay, uh, can, uh, can you see the values yeah, here? So two, and in our with our machines, what kind of helps a little bit is when it's pink, it's outside of our reference limits. Yes. So what this shows that you, your uh, response amplitudes, uh, I would consider our low at two millivolts uh, at the knee. Uh, generally, I would want that to be at least four millivolts. So this is low. Uh, it's low both distally and proximally. Um, your velocity is mildly slow at 38. Um, my low limit is still right at uh, about 41 for a person of this age. Distal latencies look good. Um, maybe there's just a little bit of dispersion or complexity of the compound action potential. And again, that probably reflects the loss of amplitude. So this is abnormal. So so let me ask you, uh, maybe, I don't know, this might be easier or difficult question, but whenever I see this kind of waveform of the tibial and it has a big trailing positivity, yep. it looks kind of funny. It looks different to me than the, than what we often see. Yes. Do you ever, do you ever see that? And do you know, do like, what do you make of that? Or is that just normal variation? No, I think, uh, well, this is not a normal finding. So in this situation, I would not say that that waveform is dispersed. I would not, because the configuration is really pretty much the same at ankle and knee, but it is, I think it has this configuration because we've lost amplitudes. So the other motor unit potentials that might fill in that and make it a more robust and nice smooth potential have just dropped out. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be my explanation that this probably reflects axone loss. Yeah. Do you think that the, the E2 electrode plays a role in some of this morphology? It absolutely does. In fact, the E2 drives most of the tibial CMAP amplitude uh, in contrast to the perineal. So, uh, but again, the E2 sees the whole bulk, the whole mass of the tibial innervated foot muscles. So that's why I think uh, uh, we've just, we've lost axons. Yeah. I've always thought when I see this, I, I agree that, you know, I would say the same thing. We've lost axons, but I've taken sometimes, and maybe you've done this, you know, we like to do fun things and I've taken e, the E1 electrode off or moved it sort of into yes. a silent area. When I see yep. this, this big trailing positivity and, and as I think you've done work on this, showing that a lot of this waveform, like you just said, is actually the E2 effect. Mm -hmm. And it and does that has a role in why you get a drop you don't hear but you get a drop in amplitude on the tibial right? I think so. You know, and it's at least in the standard lab for my whole career of training, the tibial posterior tibial is the only one that will allow more than about a twenty percent drop in amplitude between the distal and proximal. Now the cocktail party explanation is that because the tibial is deep at the knee, you can't fully stimulate it. I don't really buy that. You know, I, I think you can turn the stimulus up to the point that the room lights start to dim and Indianapolis Power and Light calls the lab and says, where's all this current going? You know, and uh, you still can't get it up. I think it's a montage effect. Yeah. And I think you've, you've done work on that. If I remember, you've published 
we have, but but the reason for the bigger than quote normal unquote drop in the tibial is still not explained. Mm -hmm. And um, the good Dr. Litchi is working on that right now, and the good Dr. Nandakar and uh, and uh, Barkhouse are working on it, and I'm thinking about it. And this, we should be able to answer this. It, it's a montage issue, and mm -hmm. I think it's an E1 or it's an E2 issue. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, and I hear the same thing that most people, like you said, say, oh, you're just not super maximum. We know that isn't the case because we see yep. that amplitude stop going up when we're increasing. We know we're maximal. So, OK, well, interesting. So, OK, so here we have so we have this low amplitude and then I'm going to show you the Sero. We did the Sero also, but oh, actually, I forgot about this. We did yep. tibial F waves. So. Anything unusual there in your eye? Well, uh, there's uh, that's a nice picture. Um, so uh, first of all, the F waves are there uh, like they usually are in the tibial, even with reduced amplitude. But there's a lot of early activity there that are that are axon reflexes. So this um, right, this yeah, right, right here, there, even even earlier, right there. Those are beautiful one, axon yeah. reflexes. So what is it? How do you interpret an axon reflex? Well, that suggests to me that there's been uh, has been damage to the axon somewhere, you know, from the nerve root all the way out into the foot. There's been uh, uh, axonal damage and there's been sprouting, re et etc. And uh, I don't think anybody particularly knows how long it takes this to develop, but this suggests to me a chronic lesion. You know, this is not an acute or probably even subacute lesion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it is this is this always abnormal, an A wave? Do you when you see it, or do you think there's some abnormality there? I think it's always abnormal. So can I tell you an interesting story? Yes. <laughs> this summer, we, my wife and I, went on this long hike in Europe. We trained and trained. Uh, it was a hundred mile hike over ten days, and while we were train, my training consisted of walking up our hospital stairs stories like nine stories up and down multiple times because we don't have any elevation in Jacksonville. For sure. Yeah. Your maximum <laughs> a minute elevation is probably what differs by 10 feet. Yeah. It's about yeah. 10 feet and we had to go up thousands of feet. So <laughs> uh, I got bored of our hospital stairs, but as during the training, one day I was showing one of our techs, I believe something with the tibial nerve and I stimulated my, did my tibial nerve and uh, I did an F wave and lo and behold, I had A waves. Really? Yeah. And I said, wow, that's interesting. And I said, I, I don't know why I don't have any, I don't, I've never had radiculopathy or, you know, as far as I know, I don't have any problem. And I said, I wonder if something, there's some strain on the nerve, you know, I'm just, with all the exercise and workout, I'm there's irritability of the tibial nerve or the sciatic nerve or something. So I said, let me see if if it's consistent. So the next day I went into the lab, uh, same thing. It was same the same A wave didn't change. And I did that for about a week. It hadn't changed. And I said, I'm gonna see what happens when uh I'm done exercising afterwards. Yeah. And so I came back after the hike, you know, and recently I said, I'm going to see if my A wave's there and it's gone. So I have no idea what that means, <laughs> but, but it was there. It's consistently. And then it went away. Interesting. So um, uh, did you search the literature on that, anything like that? Yeah, there actually are, there, there are some papers looking at A waves in the, particularly in the tibial nerve and normal individuals and a small percentage of normal people will have a waves in the tip particularly in the tibial yeah i i have a tibia or a wave on one one side um, yeah so i think that means only cool people have a waves. so i think we're okay very interesting so um so uh, that that's worth a letter to the editor or something like that yeah, or right. report. yeah well or a fun story on lessons to the lab or at um, at uh, EMG talk. Right. There we go. We'll save it for that. So anyway, but I agree with you otherwise. I think that in the especially in the context of a low tibial motor amplitude, I would 
wonder if this is indicative of some chronic nerve problem. Yeah. So your F is 47. Um, what was the perineal or the fibular F was? What? That was 52. 52. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and then here's the Searle. So yes. 55 year old. Mm -hmm. And we did, yeah, so we did three points and the, the B yeah. point was 12 and the velocity was 44. So for a 55 year old, what do you think? Yeah. Oh, those are fine. So your uh, your amplitude at B, which is fourteen centimeters, uh, is isn't it? That's still fourteen. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There's somewhere in the Old Testament that that appears. You know that <laughs> right. point, 14. B, point yeah. B is fourteen centimeters. <laughs> exactly. In Olmstead County, Minnesota, but uh, so twelve microvolts with a three point nine peak latency is absolutely fine. Yeah. So so what do you have like? You know, how, how do you justify this in this context where a patient has symptoms that sound typical of neuropathy and in this, we get these results? Yeah. Well, the normal SURL uh, is strong evidence against this being at least a standard link dependent polyneuropathy. The normality of the fibular is evidence, uh, you know, against L5. So, uh, I would consider that this person could have an S1 radic mm -hmm. because of the predominant involvement of their, their the innervation of the foot muscles, S1, S2. Uh, you've got a little bit of a low amplitude or you've got a low amplitude period and mildly slow velocity. So that could represent uh, just axone loss in the S1 nerve root. Uh, and with a preganglionic lesion, you've got a beautifully spurred sural. So, so that'd, be, that'd be a possible explanation. And that, so then what would you do in your lab with this? Would you do other conductions or just do needle exam or? Time for pokey pokey. Time for poking. Okay. And I probably know what you would poke, but, but yeah. I'll ask you anyway, what is your approach in a patient like this? Well, the standard approach would be uh, uh, tib anterior, uh, medial gastroc, um uh, a quadriceps and over the years i've switched from v lat to v medialis partly because the v lat motor unit potentials can be so big in normals it can be hard to make a call so i would start there and um, uh, i would likely plan on sa sampling some additional s1 muscles uh this would be a perfect reason to poke the abductor lucis you know because that's where the low amplitude is coming from so i would poke a foot muscle at least to look at rest activity, and then likely a short head of biceps femoris. And again, I'm guided by my findings, short head of biceps femoris, which is, I think is more S1 than L5, maybe a glute max. And, uh, and this is somebody definitely you should do a lumbar paraspinal, assuming that the needle exam is abnormal, like in the gastroc. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and that, uh, yeah, I, I, we, I know you, we think alike and I would think the same way. We were trained uh, by the same Jedi master. Yeah, right. Uh, and I was trained by you too. And you were, you know, as we discussed things and, uh, but let me tell you what it showed. So okay. the anterior tibialis and medial gastrocnemius were normal. Okay. The proximal muscles that you mentioned, I didn't do the short head of the biceps, but I did TFL and gluteus maximus were normal. Okay. The AH had two plus fibs. Mm-hmm. And um, in that muscle, I didn't look at motor units, but I did do first dorsal interosseous pedis. Yes. Another foot muscle, and it had two plus fibs. Could you and, could the patient activate? Yeah. Motor and the motor the unit potentials were large, long yeah. duration, high amplitude. And I also did a peroneus tertius. Ah, yes. And that had long duration, high amplitude motor units without fibrillations. Okay. So the um, only people that know how to do tertius, at least that I'm aware of, have been trained by you. My colleague, Cynthia Bodkin, here is the, my perineus tertius person. And if I need that, I have to go next door, the office next <laughs> door and say, Cindy, I need a little help here. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it's a nice distal muscle by the ankle and it, you know, gets out of the tibial distribution. Yes. But, so but yeah, so. What, what myotome do you consider that? 
what myotome L, L5. Yeah, L5. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was abnormal, as was the AH. And FDIP. First FDIP. Is, yeah. Okay. So, so, you know, I struggle with these. This. Mm -hmm. So here I have a clinical history that's very consistent with a distal neuropathy. Yes. Changes on needle exam that's consistent. Mm -hmm. Only a low tibial with a normal sural. Yes. So the, am I wrong in thinking this still could be a distal neuropathy? It still could be. So do you have a medial plantar? Uh, I didn't do it in this patient. Okay. So he's 55. Does that, would that help you if you, would you do it or how would you interpret well, that? I would trust it only if there was a, a nice, easily obtainable response. Uh, yeah. And it depends what the patients did, you know, if, if they were on their feet a lot or whatever. So, um, um, I mean, in the standard hierarchy of polyneuropathies, I expect Searle to be involved most so, fibular to be involved next most so, and then tibial to be least most involved, at least in the hierarchy. And here we've shown actually the opposite. Yeah, I know. It It's not, it doesn't fit the textbook. Which well, so... I, I, uh, you know, the patients don't have to read the text I know. before they come through your door. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, you know, what I always struggle with, and, and I think we both know this, is, yes, this looks like a really nice Searle, and it probably is normal. But mm -hmm. at the same time, we don't really know truly what's normal for this patient. Yes. And this could be, you know, yes, A point looks great. It's 24 microvolts. But maybe mm -hmm. this patient Searle at B point was 24 two years ago, and maybe this is a, a drop for the patient, even though he's 55. Mm -hmm. And I think that's always a challenge that I always find that we just don't know what's normal for that individual person. So, I, so I, um, what did the MRI show? The MRI wasn't done at this okay. patient. I, I think this patient did. Yeah, and I guess the other point I would say is the plantar, I think, is a good thought. I, we didn't do it in this patient, but mm -hmm. Here, the Searle looks really good if the planter was completely absent, even though in a 55-year-old, they may not have a nice medial planter. In this context, if the planter was absent with a good Searle, that might make me think that, yes, there is a very distal type mm -hmm. of neuropathy there and kind of push me over the edge. So You could also consider that maybe this patient had a, a, a tibial neuropathy at the ankle or tarsal tunnel. Now, those are profoundly rare. Uh, the distal latency was normal uh, in the tibial study. So to me, that would be evidence against a localized lesion. Uh, but in theory, and then the perineus tertius knocks that out too. Right. Uh, that it could right. not it could not be explained by a distal tibial neuropathy alone. Right, exactly. And, you know, I, I don't know in your practice, you know, sometimes we do get these patients where all the conductions are are normal. Yeah. Right. It, so he, it, like if we change the scenario, the tibial motor was also normal and the Searle, let's say it was 60 years old patient, the Searle's two and you don't know, is it normal or abnormal? Mm -hmm. You know, are you comfortable in the right clinical context? Are you comfortable making an interpretation of a neuropathy if you only have changes on your needle exam with totally normal conductions? I am not. Uh, I would just say, you know, it's abnormal, and the uh, the significance of these findings is unclear uh, currently. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like the term clinical correlation is advised, but in this case, clinical correlation might be advised. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I I I, I think those are good points, and you know, again, we like it when everything fits, but. I, I certainly have, every, I don't think I've ever gone a day where everything has fit mm -hmm. in the lab. So, um, so I think the, the point, you know, not to present to the, those watching a complicated case, but to present something that is real life and that we have to sort of make these decisions and interpretations based on findings that may not all perfectly fit into the That's textbook. Good. Yeah. So with your, in your uh, schemata of uh, hierarchy of abnormality, 
uh, let's just say in motor nerve conduction studies, let's say a polyneuropathy is present. Do you think the fibular tends to be involved earlier and more than the posterior tibial or equal or vice versa or what? I think it does, but I think there's a couple things that the fibular tends to sometimes be involved without any disease. Yes. Right. So I think that sometimes can be hard to interpret when you just have a low fibular and no and a normal tibial. I agree. But I think yes. And and in fact, that's sort of, you know, it feels like I plant you planted that question. But um, I just was going to show this one last thing that. Yes, I remember this. uh, I remember this um, paper. That was not a plant, but uh, nope. but yeah, it just, we did it spontaneous. It ref, it reflects synergistic thinking, <laughs> right? So this was a small study we did. One of our fellows did where it was basically we took a, our a, our patients that had just an absolutely lower tibial motor amplitude compared to the fibular motor, mm-hmm. because we know the normal values the tibial is usually higher than the the fibular. So we said absolute tibial is lower than fibular. And we only found that n- normally in 7% of normal people. Mm-hmm. And so most people, it's always, almost always the tibials higher. And in about equal amount, they either had neuropathy or they had uh, S1 radiculopathies, mm-hmm. which you would kind of expect. So I think that that shows that sort of counters the point that it's not always the fibular more than the tibial in, in a length dependent neuropathy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good, uh, I think that's a good point. And it probably, uh, it supports doing all three nerves if you're screening the patient for a polyneuropathy. Yeah. The other thing that I do, just the last point is so in older patients where the sural uh, we don't know what's normal, if it could be absent or if you get a low sural and let's say you get two or five microvolts, you don't know, is that normal? Sometimes if I, sometimes we'll go up and do a sensory in an arm, Yes, you know, where you should have better established reference values, even mm-hmm. in older people. And then if it's low in the hand, then maybe that pushes us over the edge. So then what's your preferred upper extremity sensory to, to fill that bill? <laughs> Well, I it depends on the how I'm feeling that day. So <laughs> okay. if I've had my hot chocolate, then it's usually the median scent antidromic. Yes. Uh, you know, I think that the the issue is do you want to look for do a nerve that might also have a compressive neuropathy? Right. And do you want to find that too or not? So we do the median antidromic and ulnar motor. And then if the median sensory is abnormal, then we'll do an ulnar sensor and then we might do a radial sensory. So in that scenario, I tend to use the ulnar sensory just to avoid the possibility of the incidentally discovered carpal tunnel or median neuropathy at the wrist. So, um, so the ulnar uh, sensory antidromic, uh, I use in that scenario and then also the radial, although I think our range of amplitudes on radial is probably narrower than the ulnar, and maybe our our security or robust robustness of the data is not quite as good for the radial, uh, you know, because the amplitudes really can vary quite a bit with where your uh, electrodes are and stuff like that. So in this situation you described, I would probably do an ulnar sensory just to avoid the incidental median neuropathy at the wrist that's sitting there waiting for you. What about the incidental ulnar neuropathy because they're leaning on their elbow? Um, I think the carpal t- the median lesion is probably more common, but I can't cite a paper for you on that. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I mean, yeah, that's all. And those are even more difficult patients, right? Where you find the medians long and low, and then you do the ulnar, it's a little bit prolonged and low. Yeah. And is it is it three things or is it uh, or is it all part of the same process? So, yep. so yeah, and I think that's the challenge and the enjoyment of being an EMG or, you know, that's right. Yeah. It's, uh, I think those cases that are challenging and make us think are much more fun most of the time than the ones that are just slam dunk mm-hmm. straightforward. We start with the hypothesis based on what the referring uh, information says what we've learned from talking to the patient and we apply our tests, we generate data and it's a dynamic process, you know. Exactly. 
Uh, you just don't drive up to the drive through and poke your hand in you know, and say, rule out CTS and pull it back out and you, <laughs> and you go, go on. Yeah, right. Well, some people do that, but yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> I love that analogy, the drive through CTS. Yeah, so. drive through CTS. You know, I have a quarter pound of a cheese, a uh, small diet, and a, a CTS of a <laughs> Right, right. Well, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. This is really a great discussion. Uh, I think, you know, I, I, I think this is valuable. I hope it's valuable for our listeners. Uh, and, and like I said, this is it's I think it's more valuable to present real life cases yes. rather than just the obvious easy cases that it's pretty obvious. So I, I'm it's it's great to hear your insight and your experience in this. I appreciate you reaching out to me. Uh, you know, I enjoy doing EMGs every day. I, I usually don't do them on Saturday and Sunday, but uh, it's still very fulfilling to just see the data, to see how the thinking process works to work with residents and fellows, you know, to help guide them. And uh, it's uh, it's just profoundly rewarding. And and we have we have determinal parameters, you know. Uh, we can generate data and and see how that fits with the hypothesis. So it's uh, it's still absolutely totally fun every day. I agree completely. My days, I know it's gonna be a great day when I'm working in the EMG lab and can can learn and think and smile and have fun so i agree 100 percent. well let's figure out a time where i can come and get a ball of cotton okay um we'll work it out we'll you we'll bring you as a visiting professor in the lab maybe uh, do a little play a little golf too you know you can tell your chairman if you're in neurology department that you're going to a stroke conference so that's a yeah right <laughs> That's right. All right. And, I, and I'll see. We're just testing out whether I'll get carpal tunnel or an ulnar neuropathy on my bad swing. Okay. And uh, the your observations on the A waves are very, very interesting. Yeah, I think I think you should, after you do whatever exercise you do, you know, golf or ride a bike, test your, your do a tibial F wave. See if you have an A wave. We'll check it out. Results yeah. to follow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Great seeing you. My pleasure. Have a great day in Jacksonville or wherever your journeys may take you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Lessons from the Lab. I hope you learned something about the evaluation of patients with peripheral neuropathy. I certainly have learned that not everyone follows the textbook. Everything's not perfect in the lab. And sometimes we have to think a little bit outside of the box and take the pieces of information and into the context of the clinical problem to determine whether there's an abnormality that we can identify by testing. Uh, I've learned uh, about A waves that uh, they're only seen in very interesting people, maybe, uh, that they're nonspecific, they can be seen in normal people and in people with chronic peripheral nervous system disorders. And I've learned that uh, the hammer, Traumner hammer is a great tool. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something. I hope you can apply this in your practice and we'll see you next time.